curing malaria? Yes, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm Aaron McLeod, and today on Starting Ideas, I'm going to have a conversation with Ken Stewart, who founded CIDR, the Center for Infectious Disease Research. Ugh, try saying that three times fast. But Ken started in 1976 with one idea and one grant, and he grew that to over 300 people in the Seattle area and the world's largest center devoted to infectious disease research. He was able to execute on his idea and bring it into the world. So let's go talk with Ken. We're here with Dr. Ken Stewart of the uh, Center for Infectious Disease Research. And Ken, can you just tell us a little bit about CIDR? Yes, I'd be happy to. So the center is a private not-for-profit research organization that is entirely focused on global infectious diseases. The biggest killers, frankly, uh, and based on uh, health problems, mm -hmm. they are malaria, mm -hmm. HIV, TB, but also more recently diseases like Zika or dengue virus. Interesting. So um, that's your current focus of your research. I'm curious about when you started CIDR back in 1976, and right. it was Seattle Biomed. Um, right. How did you go about getting this from an idea into reality? I was at a uh, university in Florida. I had just gotten my first grant. I wasn't particularly happy with the university that I was at, mainly because I didn't feel there was enough ambition to do the research that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. At that time, I worked on a, uh, an organism that causes African sleeping sickness called trypanosomes. Mm -hmm. It and related organisms cause diseases that kill approaching a million people a year. So I was fascinated by two things. One is the incredible biology that these organisms represented but also the real practical human problem that these were diseases that were killing many, many people. So at that time, at least, you said they were neglected. Um, right. Why do you think they were neglected as opposed to some of the other diseases at the time? These diseases are diseases of the poor. Mm -hmm. There is no economic incentive, direct economic incentive of these diseases that would induce a pharmaceutical company to develop a vaccine or a drug. Mm. That's a, a sad truth. Right. But you would realize that you had this ambition to attack those diseases which didn't have the focus. Um, you, you were from an academic background, but how did you go about making it into a, an organization? So uh, I got my first research grant from NIH when I was at this university in Florida and told them that I really didn't want to start the grant up at this university, but I wanted to start up a research center and move the grant to that research center and because I thought, rightfully so, that I could be more successful in uh, performing on that grant mm -hmm. and also that it was a better environment for me to do the research that uh, needed to be done. At that time I was also uh, exploring uh, various areas to cite such a research activity and one of the places that I explored was Seattle area mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons one of which was because uh, the University of Washington has a long and rich history in infectious disease research. It was a, it's a big research, well-funded research university. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that that would be an excellent uh, environment, academic environment, mm -hmm. and research environment in which to do this work. And then I transferred the grant to mm -hmm. this uh, organization, mm -hmm. packed up my U-Haul, and drove from Florida to Seattle. Nice. That took a lot of initiative. <laughs> uh, I was highly motivated. <laughs> I think I'm still highly motivated, actually. <laughs> well, that comes through. Um, in the early years, though, what were, what were some of the more, I guess, business, organizational, and finance challenges you dealt with? Because talking to other academics, one grant will not see you through. They were many. <laughs> I, can <tell> you, <laughs> I can tell you that. When I first moved out, uh, one of the pieces of equipment that I needed for my research was an ultracentrifuge. Mm -hmm. It cost uh, $20,000. Uh, I had half the amount of money to buy that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went to uh, what is now defunct Washington Mutual Bank and I showed them the 
notice of grant award from NIH and I said I need to borrow $10,000. And for whatever reason, they agreed. <laughs> they loaned me $10,000. How did you get the other equipment? We built the benches. We literally built the benches that we did the research on and we built uh, some of the equipment. So there was uh, electrical uh, equipment, power supplies for electrophoresis. So at night I would buy these kits from Edmund Scientific and sit up and solder the pieces together for these power supplies and cut up plastic and glue it together to make the uh, containers for doing what's called gel electrophoresis. Uh, even though our equipment was homemade, some of the findings uh, that we made at that time, so one of the early discoveries we made is uh, in an area called, or a, a field called RNA editing. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, one of the early discoverers of this whole process of RNA editing. And so we found that uh, this totally novel uh, process, which was how genetic information, which is contained in DNA and then made into RNA and then ultimately into proteins, which are the work horses that do things. Mm -hmm. We discovered uh, that this RNA, after it's made, the meaning of that RNA can get changed. And this was really? ex yeah, extremely novel at mm -hmm. the time. In fact, it wasn't well accepted for a couple of years. <laughs> I can say that. Well, that uh, just proves that it was novel, doesn't it, that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, yes. So um, you had these great findings. People didn't accept them. You didn't have the buy-in. and. Uh, your grant was not going to last forever. How did institutionally sort of, what was the next sort of crux point? When people don't believe your work, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a bad thing or a criticism. It drives you to prove it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did. In fact, uh, I tell people in my lab regularly, my job is to be a skeptic. You have to demonstrate to me that the finding that you've made or the conclusion that you've drawn is actually correct. Mm -hmm. So after these initial findings in my own laboratory was expanding and growing and getting more and more recognition, other scientists found uh, our organization and joined us because they were also interested in mm -hmm. having highly focused research activities in a more independent environment. The laboratory at that time was in Issaquah which is about 10 miles uh, and not exactly in the center of the research universe. So we decided that it was time to move into uh, the city. And so one of our board members, in fact, president of our board, uh, was also at a, a sister organization called PATH, mm -hmm. and they were developing a building uh, on the Ship Canal down mm -hmm. in Seattle, and they asked us if we'd be interested in becoming a tenant in that uh, building. So we did, and we initially moved in in the basement, literally in the basement of that basement, building. Right on the canal. Right on the canal, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, more and more people became aware of us uh, and more people started uh, joining us. Mm -hmm. But there was a very pivotal point uh, not too long after we be, uh, moved to the ship canal. I decided that it was time for us to get some uh, external uh, evaluation of our whole research program and us as an institution. Mm -hmm. The first recommendation was actually by the Dean of the School of Public Health, was an invitation for the uh, center to affiliate with the University of Washington. And so the dean, the dean recognized this. Mm -hmm. And so I always like to say that uh, because they invited us to affiliate with uh, the university, that actually it's the university that's affiliated with us. <laughs> Rather than the other way around. Rather than the other way around, right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I ended up chairing uh, that pathobiology department uh, for seven years. Uh, I was instrumental in developing a, a PhD program there, which is called the pathobiology. And we still at this institution uh, get graduate students from that department. You basically did a ton of outreach to local university, the science community, yeah. yes. and just kept promoting both your research and your ideas. Yes, so it wasn't all my ideas. We had a board, uh, we've always had a board, and our board at, who uh, are people with uh, very good business expertise uh, said quite early on, well, you need to have a strategic plan. That was a learning exercise in itself, how to actually effectively develop a strategic plan is something that I had no experience with, mm -hmm. but I've done multiple times now. And so as part of this strategic planning, uh, we developed uh, 
I guess what I would lightly call an algorithm of what diseases would we work on and why. So the diseases that we chose were diseases that were big important diseases, mm -hmm. uh, diseases where we had the expertise that we could actually do something uh, to advance uh, understanding of these diseases that could lead to vaccines, drugs, and diagnostics that there were resources out there that we could identify and get to support uh, the activity and that we had researchers that could, or that we either had them or we could recruit researchers to work on these uh, diseases. The next disease that we chose was malaria, mm -hmm. uh, which is, as you know, a Because huge you wanted problem. something easy and simple to attack, right? <laughs> no, quite the opposite. I am. Uh, perversely attracted to biological complexity. Okay, it's one of the things that I find intriguing is trying to solve these complex problems. So I went over to uh, NIH and I asked them to give me a culture of malaria because I wanted the, the institute to start working on mm -hmm. malaria because yeah. I was frustrated listening to the science and I knew this was important. Mm -hmm. So I brought literally on the airplane a culture of malaria so I like a little petri dish or like little plastic bottle, a little plastic yeah, little bottle. culture bottle mm -hmm. uh, with live malaria, human malaria. Couldn't so do this, it today. This was before you uh, would get searched. Uh, yes, getting yes, <laughs> right, yes. So uh, I brought it back uh, to Seattle, so I can say I brought malaria to Seattle. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, I don't know a if I'm the first. Yeah, I don't know if I'm first, but I brought it to uh, brought it to Seattle. That was the beginning of our uh, malaria research program. Nice. Um, what do you see as really the next thing for CIDR and yourself to tackle? A few things come to mind. So one is uh, what is now called synthetic biology, which is the ability to, I think, further manipulate biological systems. This uh, is sometimes frightening to people, but in fact we've been manipulating biological systems for eons. Uh, dog breeding, plant breeding. The difference here is that we're able to uh, change biological systems more quickly and probably in uh, ways that we couldn't have even conceived of before. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this means that uh, we may have the ability, for example, to develop new immunization techniques where we can use organisms uh, to deliver vaccines rather than syringe vaccines. A vaccine. pathogen of health. A pathogen of health, right. Okay. A, a good bug rather than mm -hmm. a bad bug, right. Uh, so that's, uh, or the ability to, as they're now doing with uh, immune therapy, take your own cells and make some changes in your own cells and reintroduce them into you so that they are able to eliminate uh, tumor cells or uh, cells that are behaving uh, inappropriately. The whole body ecosystem effect there. Exactly. So if you were talking to a young academic or researcher, who really wanted to do something with their research and uh, bring it beyond the laboratory or beyond their PhD, what would you tell them? I think I would uh, give them the same advice that I got many decades ago from a uh, person I did a postdoc with. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, decide what you think is important mm -hmm. and then act on it. Mm -hmm. So I think like so many other things, it's uh, find your passion, find where your interest is, Mm -hmm. and then uh, just push as hard as you can, but in the right way, uh, to be able to accomplish what you think is important. Obviously, your work is incredibly consuming and you love it. That's apparent throughout this whole yeah. interview. Um, but what do you do, like, at some point, you, you must go home to some place that is not the lab. Yes. Um, what do you do to relax and unwind? I do like to relax. Mm -hmm. I tend to uh, relax in a more active fashion. So uh, I like to sail. I like scuba diving. I like diving. I don't dive around here. I like to go to the warmer waters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I enjoy that uh, very much, or sailing in the warmer waters. And mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy skiing as well. Uh, I enjoy skiing very much. So, uh, and reading. Mm -hmm. And I do watch television. You know, I do like to get some. Uh, uh, Freedom of the brain. And that little bit of the day that you're not doing <laughs> yes, <laughs> everything right. else. Exactly. Is there one thought you could leave us with? Yeah, I guess, I guess the thought that I would leave, leave you with is uh, there should be more organizations like this. Mm -hmm. This is a really 
important. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> As you can tell. So do you feel I am totally. About it? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you watch television at night and you see people suffering, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Suffering from these diseases. Okay. Mm -hmm. And y here we have uh, somewhere between two and 300 people uh, trying to deal with diseases that are affecting 7 billion people. Well, not 7 billion, but billions of people on, in the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're struggling every day to make incremental progress on these huge, important problems. And uh, it is a crime, in my mind, that there's not more organizations like this and more work that's being done in, the, in this area. So that's, that's what I would leave you with. Okay. Well, Ken, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Thanks for giving me the chance. <laughs> hey guys, thanks so much for watching my very first Starting Ideas video. You have no idea how much planning went into this. But if you believe that ideas change the world, if you believe that one person can change the world, please click subscribe and support Starting Ideas on Patreon, because I really want to keep more great quality content coming your way with people whose thoughts and ambitions have driven them to alter the world and make it a better place. See you later.